you just heard, um, this month is the theme, the theme is love stories in the Bible. You know, there are many great love stories in the Bible. I love to read them. You know, there's the story of Boaz and Ruth, yeah. and there's Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and Rachel, just to name a few. You know, uh, but today, the love story I want to talk about, I find it a touching, so touching, so compelling, so amazing. You know, this love story is a beautiful rags to riches account about a wealthy ruler who lavishes his unconditional love on the lowly, despised, unwanted girl. He provides for her and he gives her everything that she needs. And when she's old enough for love, he marries her. But sadly, the love story is one-sided. Once she grows and she becomes lovely and beautiful, she becomes unfaithful to him, and she leaves him. It's so sad, but the good part is that is not the end of the story. And the love story that I'm speaking about, we will find in Ezekiel 16. And the lover of a husband is God, and the beloved is his people. And the story is really not literal, it's an allegory. It's, it's, um, it's really depicting God's love for his people Israel. How he brought them out of Egypt. And he entered into a covenant with them. And they were, it was based primarily on physical promises. That they would be his people and he would be their God. And the story it begins in a very tragic way, actually. In Ezekiel 16, begins like this. It says, the word of the Lord came to me and he said, Son of man, confront Jerusalem with their detestable practices and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloth. No one looks at you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into an open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. So imagine this. Imagine this little girl is born to parents who does not want her. She's so despised that the blood is not even washed off of her. This new, you know, her newly born body is not even clean. Instead, she's thrown into an open field. Can you imagine that? You know, um, you know, we recently heard a story like that. You remember that little girl who was thrown into a dumpster, a newborn was thrown into a house, broke our hearts. So that's, that's so sad. But here is this little girl in our story who's thrown into an open field and left to die. You know, how heartless. So God, this wealthy, sovereign king, he passes by, and he sees this little helpless girl, and he's moved with compassion. Because verse 6 says, Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. So God takes this little unwanted, unwashed, unattractive girl who's fighting for her life, and he says, live. In other words, he, was, he nurtures her, and he provides for her everything that she needs to live and to grow. He said, I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and you developed and you entered puberty. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked, or you who were stark naked and bare. So the text shows that she grew like a plant of the field. And when you think of how you have to nurture a plant, you have to water it to make it grow, you have to care for it. You know, I remember when my daughter was born, she was the tiniest little baby. And the doctor said, you've got to make sure that she gets you know, X number of ounces of milk so that she would grow. And so I remember how careful we were to make sure that she got the proper nutrition. She got enough of that milk so that she would grow because we wanted her to grow and flourish and be healthy. So God gives personal attention and care to this girl. And again, I just want to emphasize that this is all symbolic of his people. So he did this until she became, she grew and she became very, very beautiful. And it says, later, I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corners of my garment over you and covered your naked body. And 
I gave my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. So then this wonderful, wealthy king revisits the girl again, and he finds that she's reached a mature age for marriage. And because he's in love with her, he enters into a covenant, which is similar to a marriage proposal, and she becomes his wife. And in verse 9 to 14, it goes on to describe how he lavishes his, her with clothes and perfume and jewelry and gifts, and he gives her food. And because of his loving hair, she rises in status to become a beautiful, famous queen. Wow. You know, this girl who was once abandoned and despised and unwanted, now she's experienced an incredible incredible turn of events in her life. She's now loved, accepted by, and even married to the king of kings. She goes from rags to riches, from being unwanted to desirable, from obscurity to fame, from unattractive to beautiful. She was beautiful as a queen. You know, Disney could not have written a better love story. You know, and I love this story because God is so amazing. He's so amazing. He can bring us from nothing, and he can have us sit in high places with him. He can bring us from meaningless to significant. He can take us from being broken to being whole. That's why I just love to read that. You know, but sadly, the story, again, takes another tragic turn. The wife begins to trust in her beauty. As she uses her beauty, it says, and her fame to attract strange foreign lovers. And she becomes unfaithful to the king. Imagine that in the worst possible way. And she's now filled with pride and vanity. And she breaks the covenant with him. And she leaves him. So as a result, she loses everything. But as I mentioned, that is not the end of the story. That is not the end. Because in Ezekiel 60, God even in spite of all that Israel did, in verse 60 rather, God says, yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. So God did not give up on unfaithful Israel. You know, a human husband might give up on his unfaithful wife, and you know, you can argue that he, he's well within his rights, but God did not give up. Because, you know why? He had a plan for something even greater, even greater. He had a better deal. He had a new, eternal covenant. Now, not just with one nation, but all nations. So this everlasting covenant is explained in Hebrews 8.10. It says, this covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my pe people. So God established a new covenant with all nations, not just one nation, with all nations. And this covenant is based on spiritual promises. He says he will write his laws in their hearts. This is more spiritual now. You know, so the ultimate love story is God desired to have an eternal relationship with us, all of us, all nations, all humanity. He desired so much to have a relationship with us. But because we are sinners, because we are naked and bare spiritually, the only way that this relationship can take place is through no other than Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of all mankind. The one who was the God of Abraham, the one who was the God of Isaac. He was the God of Israel. And he would come. He would come and rescue us, and he would cover us. He would cover our sins with his shed blood. So Jesus, the sovereign king, he came to earth. And he walked among us. And he lived a perfect life, conquering sin in the flesh. And at the Last Supper, with his disciples, he established the new covenant. When he took that bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in 
the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. An hour later, he became naked and bare as he hung on the cross, with his blood shed and his body broken. And his death freed us from the filth, and it freed us from loneliness and pain that comes that, that, that is the result of the, the consequences of sin and death. That's love. Romans 5, it says that while we were still sinners and enemies of Christ, he died for us. That's love. Ephesians 5, 25 to 7 says, Christ loved the church that he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. That's love. Jesus gave himself to cleanse us and he washed us to make us holy so that we could be his bride without spot or wrinkle. And why? Because God, that Jesus is God and God is love. The love of God is the same yesterday, today, mm. and forever. God's love yesterday was towards his physical bride, Israel, the children of Israel. And today, he expresses his love in an even greater way through, the, through his death on the cross to redeem us, all of us, all nations, no matter who you are. And, his, and so we will be his spiritual bride, his body church. And forever we will live with him in the fullest expression of his love in the very presence of God. And this is so that the, the scripture in Revelation 21, 3-4 can be fulfilled. And it says, and I had heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, you know, I just love that. So look, exclamation. It's almost like, wow, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And that's not all. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no crying, no pain. For the old order of things has passed away. It's gone. So, what should be our response for so great a love? is to be humbled by our sin, to be thankful for his sacrifice, to be amazed by his grace, and to be led by the Holy Spirit to love him in return. Amen? Amen.